Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols Plus, a PlayStation podcast supplement. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined today by a very special guest indeed. He is the director and designer and mind behind games like 2008's Braid, which came to PlayStation 3 in 2009, as well as The Witness, which was one of the very first PS4 games we ever saw, um, revealed back in 2013, launched in 2016. I'm too stupid for either of these games, um, but a lot of you guys out there enjoyed them. Jonathan Blow, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you for taking the time to be here with me. Yeah, it's good to be here. Um, how's life? How's everything going? You're such a interesting character to so many people. <laughs> Everyone's always interested in what, what you're doing. How's life? How's everything going? And well, you know, after the witness shipped, um, so, okay. One thing that people may not know is, uh, we build all our own technology in-house, including game engines and all that. We're one of the few studios still on our own engine. And as you can imagine, that's a substantial amount of work, right? Um, and so for the witness, uh, we made our own 3d engine with good lighting and all this stuff. And that was great. And then I decided I didn't like the primary language that we use to make games anymore, C++. And so I wanted to make my own programming language. And guess what? If I want to use that, our engine is in the wrong programming language and we want to revise it anyway. So the absolute worst business decision that you could ever make after investing many years and a lot of money into making a game engine is to throw it away completely without making another game. But that's what we did. So for the past freaking eight years, uh, I've been making a programming language and a compiler for that language. And then a new engine. I mean, obviously it's a team making the engine, but you know, we're, we're doing that. And then a game in the engine and the game is the biggest puzzle game that anyone's ever made, like by a wide margin. It was supposed to be a little game to just like prove out the engine and the technology. And instead it's, I just let it become a massive, massive game. And so it's not done yet, but we're getting toward the end. We can see a faint glimmering of light at the end of the tunnel. And then meanwhile, all this time, we've sort of been working on Braid Anniversary Edition as the, um, you know, as a parallel project because, you know, Braid came out in 2008 and it's a 2D game and like consoles at that time could kind of do 720p mostly. And if you run it on a nice 4K monitor now, it's super blurry and horrible. And so we wanted mm -hmm. to fix that. But then also um, I saw some opportunities to do some really interesting stuff with commentary that people hadn't done to make it more interactive and game-like, I guess. Um, so we're doing that. It's got a ridiculous amount of commentary. I think, um, I think it's around 12 hours total, um, of, of talking, <laughs> um, but with, you know, illustrations and like markup in the levels and stuff. And then there's uh, new puzzles and all that. So all these things put together, plus some other stuff that I won't talk about. Uh, it's been keeping me busy and it's been, it's been interesting because it's been a lot of hard work with like nothing new actually released to the public yet uh, after eight years, which is uh, starting to feel like a long time. But the good thing is pretty soon we will have things out for people. Awesome. Yeah, I have a very specific, I mean, I play so many games obviously, but I have a very specific memory of playing Braid in my in-law apartment in San Francisco when I was at IGN and uh, using a walkthrough because I was like, this is too, <laughs> I'm, I, if, if things don't come naturally to me, I just, the audience knows this, if things don't come naturally to me, I'm like, I, I can't do this. You know, when I saw people playing The Witness and they had their notebooks and they were doing all this stuff, I'm like, oh my God, that would be, it would destroy my mind. Um, <laughs> let me ask you this about, I didn't expect to an, an, ask you this, but about the, your, your engine, what is the impetus behind that? Is it is it simply the flexibility? Do you not want to pay the license fees? Do you want to sell it you know, or license it yourself? There's different reasons every time. So when we were doing The Witness, so that game took a long time too. Um, you know, we started that game in 2009, right after Braid, and it took it took a while, obviously. And when we started it, um, I felt that lighting was really important for the look of the game and for the look we wanted to do. You know, a lot of games um, hide lack of good lighting with other things. So we've all seen the video game 
with like the brick or stone walls with like really strong brick textures on it that are really high contrast and stuff. And it, it just gives visual interest to your eye and breaks up patterns. But I, I wanted to make this game have large fields of solid saturated color. And so it really needed lighting to uh, help define surfaces and, and help that look cohere. But also I just felt that lighting in general was very, um, was one way that games are beautiful that, that most games had not really managed to, to do a good, it's hard. I was about to say to do a good version of yet, but that's, that's oversimplified, right? Like games had proceeded technologically by steps and we were doing lots of dynamic lighting, which is when you have cool explosions, throw lights on things and whatever. But at that time, when you were just walking around in an environment, like the the static lighting or just like, you know, if you look around whatever room you're in and you look at the gradations of, of soft lighting, you know, that happened on the walls and in the corners, games hadn't really done a good mm-hmm. job of that yet. And you couldn't license an engine to do that. Like Unreal existed. I don't think Unity even really existed at that time. I don't know. If it did, it was too simple to bother with. Um, so uh, we just made an engine really for that reason, but also because, you know, if you like engineering, it's fun and interesting to make things, right? Um, okay, so all that happened and we made that game. And then for this game, there are a bunch of different reasons. Um, one is, well, again, I just like making things and mm. that's always good. And there's a nice um, pride in craftsmanship that you can have when you've made more of the thing, um, which is not to take away anything from people who use pre-licensed engines. It's just that if you're trying to make a very carefully crafted, precise experience for people, it becomes hard if you don't control the technical layer that you're sitting on because these tools are very kind of messy a lot of the time. And if you're using a bigger engine, at some point you have to take what you what it gives you in terms of the game feel or you know what you're able to do visually or how many sounds you can play or or whatever, right? Whatever's in every game has different things that are important to it. And the problem is if you've decided that certain things are of core importance to your game, and then because of the technical system you're using, you have to compromise on those things. It affects the integrity of the game as a whole. And I think we've seen a lot of that in the industry, especially as people are more and more on licensed engines. Whereas if you control what's under you, you can drill down and fix that thing that you really need to fix. It might be a lot of work to do that, right? But you can do it. Um, But then also, you know, part of the reason why I made this new programming language was um, I'm just really unhappy with the state of programming globally. I think software is a huge mess. It's way, like the number one thing about games that anyone who's ever made games will know is it's a lot of work. And that's just like the number one challenge is how much there is to do. It's like, yeah, there's a lot to learn. And, you know, if you're programming, you probably need to learn to be good at programming. And then you need to learn a bunch of math. And then you need to learn a bunch of like system stuff because you've got all these different You know, now you've got multiple threads talking to the operating system and the GPU and and all this, and it becomes like a a dynamic systems problem that old style games weren't really, right? So all that is, but but even after you become really good at all of those things, right? Um, And that's just speaking from a programming side, there's an equivalent on the art side and, and all that. But even after you become good at all those things, the challenge is still, there's constantly just a lot to do and figuring out how to do it all in a reasonable way is just very hard. And so the fact that programming is has become pathological in a weird way, where we just, as a community, make bigger and bigger messes that work more and more poorly. Um, and then it's somehow sacrilegious to point this out and to say, hey, we shouldn't necessarily be doing this. You know, um, <clears throat> I, I was very troubled by that. Uh, even back in, you know, I actually started this language, <clears throat> excuse me, I actually started this language before The Witness shipped in like 2014. So I've been working on it really a long time. It didn't become full-time until after The Witness shipped, like a full-time project for me. Um, 
but yeah, I, I had an agenda there of simplifying programming, like what, what we do when we program and, and not dumbing it down, but, you know, making a language that's very serious for very serious programmers, but that doesn't have a lot of the garbage and the, the just endless bloat that, that seems to affect everything. And so, well, if you use a, a pre-existing engine, it's got all that bloat and that cruft and those bugs and all that stuff built in. And this has very real ramifications. So if you're a programmer and you want to make a new graphical effect, right? You're, you're going to have an iterative process where you try something and then, oh, it's not quite what I wanted. Let me try again. Let me try again. And the speed of iteration is very important, right? If it takes you five days to try every version of your idea, it's going to take a really long time to do that, just that one thing. And again, as we said, because there's so much to do, that just drowns you because that happens for everything. But then also it's like impossible to have momentum and like flow of something you're working on if it becomes slow enough. And, you know, if you're working with one of these engines, you'll often have very long compile times. You know, I actually, one of the few times I worked for a AAA company, um, it was in Austin, Texas in the early 2000s, and it was a game on the Unreal Engine at that time. And to make a change and build it and launch the game took 45 minutes, like for every, every meaningful change. And there's some stuff you can do to try to get around that, but it's, it's hard and it, it gets in the way. And so, like, why? Why have we settled for this, you know? Um, this is maybe, you know, I realize I've been talking a lot about programming and this is maybe, um, maybe we can shift away from that now. To a yeah, no, I don't mind. I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm fascinated. Audience, but, <clears throat> I love um, listening to this stuff that my, our audience is very interested in the creation and business of games. So both of these things yeah. work well no, for but, us. But that's one of the reasons to make the new engine is cause I just want to fix programming, you know? Cool. Yeah. Just that little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool, man. I totally. I can totally understand what you're saying. I think uh, there's something elegant about it. Um, and time, I think, is is the greatest currency in terms of getting things done and optimizing that time, but also making the best end product. And you're kind of in an interesting position where you can take that time, you know, to do that and do it the hard way almost, which is kind of, I mean, you know, we're, we're getting pretty broke these days again, you know, like if you, if you ship a game and it's very successful as we've fortunately done twice, um, you could make a lot of money off that, but these are single player games. You know, they make, they make most of their sales early on. And so then from then on, you've got a number in the bank account and it goes down every two weeks. Right. right. And that's just like, imagine a really stressful video game with a timer. And when it hits zero, you die. And actually it hits zero. And then you're like, okay, there's some stuff I can do to not die yet. That's kind of where we are because it's just been so long. Um, but yeah, we've got good stuff that when we release it, um, people should enjoy and it should reset the timer for a while. Awesome. So I love good. I love looking at it like that. Yeah. So I said earlier that I, yeah. I'd been interested in this and I wanted to reach out to you because uh, I saw this text message or this, I keep saying text message, this tweet. That's that the text out. message. It's yeah, just text. posted in a different place. Right. Exactly. It, it, it's exactly yeah. right. Late January, you sent something um, and you had pre prefaced it by saying, if you think there have been a lot of game industry layoffs, you ain't really seen nothing yet. And you go into a bunch of things that you think are, f are kind of leading to the current work situation that we have, uh, labor yeah. situation, um, yeah. release situation, money situation. And I wanted to get into that with you today because I think it's, I don't know, I just think I thought that this was such an interesting, earnest, honest tweet that you just don't see very much of from people in positions of power. And it reminds me a little, it's a much more significant version of Sean Layden's kind of 2020 games are getting too expensive thing, but this goes mm -hmm. into much more depth in my opinion. And so I wanted to kind of pick your brain about this, but to begin the conversation, I thought that conversation, I thought I'd, I'd ask, what do you think about the business of games today? How, how are we doing? Money seems to be good, <laughs> but margins seem to be shrinking. Sony's even working at like a seven and a half percent margin now um, with PlayStation and games have obviously bloated in expense expectations are high. I think that my personal take has long been that there's a stubbornness on the consumer side to not pay more for games for certain games. Mm -hmm. um, and almost this imprint that games shouldn't be have value or are invaluable. People will buy a $25 IMAX ticket to Oppenheimer and 
spend three hours there, but balk at spending seventy dollars on a yeah. fifty hour game. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. So I'm, I'm curious, what, what do you make about you know? Let's start high. Let's start thirty thousand feet. What, what are you thinking about the games industry right now? There are so many issues here, um, and and I will I will preface this with the following statement, which is. It's actually my job to not be too concerned about business, right? In the following way, because um, I'm supposed to be making games that are different than what the rest of the industry makes and like a little bit wacky, right? It's their art games and I'm making air quotes with my hands as I say that. Um, and so as a job, my job is sort of to make business decisions that are at least unconventional. And when I, when I feel jokey about it, I say my job is to make bad business decisions that are not catastrophically bad because I don't make first person shooters or whatever, you know, whatever is the genre of the day that makes the most money. Right. Um, and I also don't, um, you know, I live in this world of this sort of, you know, not that big studio, you know, our, our company right now is 15 people. We're about to hire a couple more. But we're in this really comfortably small range, which is very different from, you know, if you look at the Horizon games or something, you know, what what is the size of those teams? And so the, the financial concerns can get pretty different. But I just got back from the DICE conference in Las Vegas, where I talked to a bunch of people um, who are studio heads of companies in this range, let's say, let's say between five people and uh, 60 people, right? Which is w once you go above 60, you start getting like really expensive and the dynamics of everything change a lot. Um, and everybody, uh, is very well aware that these are very difficult financial times, um, in which to run a company and everybody's, um, number one concern is to keep their company alive through the difficult times. Right. Some people are lucky, like if they had a hit lately and they've got a big nest egg of money from the hit, then they're, they feel comfortable and they feel fine. But they're still aware that like, oh, this is this is rough. Um, so so for these, you know, for these smaller to midsize studio, I don't know what midsize means. It probably still means bigger than 60. But, um, you know, we tend to sell games at a price point a little bit lower than the one that you mentioned. And so we don't have that exact problem. Um, but still, the dynamics are really crazy, right? There are a huge number of games out there in the world. Um, most of those games are pretty low quality, actually, right? Um, especially, I mean, even on PlayStation now, since, uh, you know, publishing there has... It's much more open than it used to be, right? But the, the consequence of that is there are a lot of games and a lot of them have just less work put into them. That's that's the reality, right? And then then if you go on to somewhere like PC, it's probably even more like that. I don't know. I haven't done a comparison lately. Yeah, fifteen. Um, what was it, 15,000 Steam games last year or something like it's, that? It's an insane number, yeah. And so, you know, when you release a game, you're like, hey, how do I get people to care about my thing? So, so that's one thing, but uh, you know, I'm going to say, and, and that's one thing that people know and that you've probably heard other people say, I'm going to try to be a little more honest about what I think, <laughs> and it's going to make some people mad. Uh, but that's, that's just, it's just what I think. If you don't like uh, some of the other things I say here, it's fine. You don't have to agree. Um, I'm not claiming uh, that everybody must believe what I say. Um, but also, to be honest, as someone who plays games, right? So games are competing with everything else um, for people's attention, right? For a long time, games were the new thing that was taking attention away from everything else, right? So like, why would people go to a theater and see a movie when they can sit home and play God of War or something, right? Um, I feel like games kind of aren't the new thing anymore. It's a little bit stealth because I think the new thing is just a different permutation of the internet that was already here, but just like stuff like TikTok and Twitter and whatever is just eating a lot of people's time and attention in a way that didn't used to happen. Right. And that time and attention comes from somewhere and that's, and, and games was the up and coming thing. And now it's the, 
been here a while thing and kind of old. And so how do you, how do you keep games from becoming a declining has been thing? Well, you, you keep the field alive with interesting new material that excites people and makes them really love playing games and really get something worthwhile out of playing games and, and, you know, feel like a better person after playing a game than before. How many games these days do that? How many games make you feel like you're a better person after you played the game than before you played the game? Um, I think the answer is almost zero, but that's a pretty high standard. Let's, let's drop back a little bit to, you know, how many games are even doing something new and interesting? Um, very few. And this is a weird, so the problem with saying stuff like this is there's a lot of problems because as soon as I start saying this, you know, pe people will say something like, oh, what about this game? And what about that game? Right. And the thing is, if you're younger, stuff is just newer to you. Right. And, and so that's one good thing that the industry has on its side is that even if it does the same things over and over, there will at least be some people to whom that stuff is new, right? But that's less than the audience used to be, right? If the audience shrinks down just to younger and younger people, um, that's not so good. Uh, but then also, um, I mean, it's just become incredibly hard to make games. And... Well, okay, let me go back to this shrinking thing for a second. Um, it's a little bit hard to actually measure whether the industry is shrinking globally. And I'm not actually making that claim because I'm not actually sure it's true. Definitely, like most online industries, we had a big bump up in 2020, 2021 because of all that stuff. And then everybody's sort of surprised that we're down from that now that people yeah, aren't like weird. locked in their house or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I do think that um, part of what's happening as well is just um, in the same way, let's say with internet, right? In the old days of the internet, for people who remembered that, there were all these blogs and people were writing like smart stuff on their blog and you could go to all these websites and they were interesting, right? And now it's sort of shrunk down to this thing where there are major social media platforms like it used to be Facebook, like Facebook is not, it's kind of dying now, I think, but um, you know, or, or Twitter or somewhere and everybody just posts there and all these other places just sort of die out. Right. So there's this thing where the biggest things win in an outsized way. And that can, if you look at the total market of games, it could be going up, but if the biggest things just keep absorbing all of that, it leaves basically nothing for everyone else. Right. And everyone else might even be a game with a budget of $75 million. Right. Like that's not that big of a budget in the modern day. Um, so, you know, I mean, Fortnite's still really big, you know, Roblox is really big. I'm sure there's some crappy match three on iOS. That's really big. I don't know. Right. Um, but in terms of the, the rest of the ecosystem of games, it feels very thin to me right now. And this is another kind of tweet that people have got mad at me for, which is again, if you're young, you don't remember, what the games industry used to be. But like, if you go back, um, let's go back even before 2008, 2008 to 2010 was kind of a golden age of indie games. But if you go back a little bit before that, um, it, it was sort of a golden age of AAA games, you know, um, because games were progressing very rapidly in terms of scope and scale and how good they looked and all these things. And, like every year there were just many, many games that were a big deal and that everybody was looking forward to and everybody was excited about. And if you look now, how many games a year meet that description? Well, I mean, it sort of depends on what you're excited by, I guess, but it's just way fewer things. And um, part of that is budgets have gone way up. Why have budgets gone way up? Well, part of it's natural because games have gotten bigger and Maybe that's something we did to ourselves. Um, part of it is they're just harder to make because of all these technical issues. Um, and then just, you know, as teams become bigger, they become less efficient. So, 
you know, a hundred person team does not do twice as much work as a 50 person team, right? A hundred person team does like maybe 1.3 times as much work as a 50 person team, like if you're lucky, yeah. right? And so costs go way up and the time to make things goes up because of all this coordination and stuff. And just, I just feel like we're being choked from many directions at once. And it's like, some people see it, but some people don't see it. Some people still think we're fine. And, um, and that the games industry is doing great, you know? And I just, I don't know. I have no vested interest in people believing me about these things. So I just don't tend to participate too much in those arguments. Sure. I'll just state my opinion and move on. Yeah, it's, it's, you have so many, I've been jotting down notes because you're saying so many interesting things. There's, um, the discoverability problem I think is, is really injuring a lot of smaller and mid-sized games. The studio, the studio I co-own, uh, you'll find this maybe interesting is we released a game, uh, one of our first games, Hybroxia years ago on Vita and PS4 and other consoles. And we brought it to PS5 as like a free download if you already own it on PS4 and vice versa. Yeah. And there was something in the back end where the date wasn't showing properly. So we never showed up on the PS4 five storefront at all in the chronological tile. Oh, no, okay. And then we got it fixed like a week later. But by that time, we were shoved down the list, maybe 60 games or something Not insane. Not a like new that. game anymore, man. After yeah, exactly. Week, and that I it. think that really hurt our ability. To, like, I'm very grateful that I have a big podcast to at least talk about my games. And it's one of the uses I have for my company while most the other guys are making the games. I just write them and talk about them. Yeah. Um, and to me, it's just, it's so frustrating because I feel like, and I wonder, I mean, this is a little bit tangential, but I'm wondering what you think about this. Like the, the walled gardens as they exist, like Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo, and so on and so forth. They think mm. that at the point of sale is where the competition and, and all that should begin. But really the discoverability happens with them first and they should be kind of sifting through this stuff. I think in a more effective way, they're injuring themselves. It doesn't seem like that. In other words, the PlayStation loves Indies era, the Braid, Shadow Complex, Geometry Wars era. It just seems so far gone to me at this point. Like they just don't, seem to care at all how it affects anyone that can make them a lot of money, I guess. And I guess that makes sense. And maybe I'm just ranting, but it's a frustrating thing I've experienced recently too, just in there being to too many games. Cause I'm not blowing or tooting our own horn by any stretch of the imagination. We literally make NES games. That's what we want to make. But our game is our games are a lot better than half the shit that is clogging up <laughs> the storefront and making it hard yeah. to find our things. And we're not Jonathan blow. Right. So we can't, or we're not naughty dog or whatever. We can't get people's attention otherwise. So. I well, find great know, frustration in the way games are sold now too. Definitely. We have, you know, I have a reputation that hopefully will lead people to be interested next time we release something, but that is a, hopefully like, I don't know what's going to happen. For example, in two months when we put braid anniversary edition on all these stores, I don't know, like we'll see, right. It's, it's just very rough. I do. There's always this question about curation and how much of it should there be, you know. Um, I do think if you run a storefront, front, you probably don't want that storefront full of like asset flip games or something, right? Because it's bad for everybody. Um, it's bad for players because if they go on and they want to find something interesting, as you say, it becomes it becomes very hard. They legitimately like. It's not just a problem from your side that people that, that you are having trouble getting attention for a game. There are people out there who would like to play your game, right? And if they can't find it, they're having a worse time, right? right? And that's my experience, for example, when I go on Steam or something, is like I can't, I can't find something that I want to play. Now, I am also pretty picky, so there's that. But... It's, you know, it, it, we have this great abundance of things, but a lot of them are just, <sighs> this is again where people, you know, get upset on the, I mean, that's what the internet is, is people right. professionally getting upset. People are like, always upset at me. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> but like, oh yeah, they're always upset yeah. at me too. Yeah. Um, There somehow we lost the idea 
I, I think we're going to get more into social issues in a minute too, because going back to like why it's so hard to make games and why there are layoffs starting now. Um, I think a lot of social issues play into it too, but we sort of lost this idea that, um, that there should be at least kind of a walled garden in some place, not everywhere. Like I think you should be able to absolutely make a game and put it on the internet for people to play and have it be on some stores somewhere. Right. That's great. But like, you want some stores that are picky and that curate and that provide you a place that you as someone who wants to play things can go and expect high quality things. And I feel like that's fallen out of fashion, perhaps just because it takes effort and it's easier mm -hmm. not to do that. Um, but also, you know, back when curation was too tight, indies were all complaining, I can't get on the store. I can't get on the store. Right? right. So there is some point that's just right. And I think that point is pretty permissive and allows a lot of things onto the store because you can't predict what's going to be a hit or whatever. <clears throat> but again, I think there's, there's some stuff that's just too bad, right? It's just trash that you have to kick your way through as you walk down the street and nobody really wants to live in trash or most people don't. And it, it's just not good. <laughs> like, I don't know what else I'm, I'm being repetitive here, but no, I, I, yeah. it's interesting because, I, I wonder what you think of this. I mean, I, I've floated this for many years and I don't know how they would do it, but a, a company like Sony has an odd number of people on some sort of council. They pay, this is their job. Maybe let's say it's nine people. They pay a million dollars, 1.1, $1.2 million to employ all these people a year. And yeah. their entire job is to simply vet everything that comes through quickly and vote and vote on it. Insert like yes or no, yes or no just based on screenshots, videos, what you know about how these games sell, like what is the value to Sony of a bad game selling literally 50 copies? The, the geography on the store is worth more than that. You know, so you would want to just bump it off. I also wonder what you think. This is kind of crazy because people used to think this was so tyrannical, but like Nintendo kind of had a good idea with limiting people's ability to publish, limiting entities' abilities to publish X amount of times a year yeah. or have ass access to certain amounts of cartridges. That whole bespoke era is done now. Like EA basically stealing other developers cartridges for Madden and all of that kind of stuff. And there was not <laughs> enough for things to go around. Those days are done. I understand that, but I do love the yeah. idea of saying like you make it your best shot. Cause you have one a yeah, year I, as a, you know, or whatever I as a small know. publisher or something. Like on the one hand, I do think some things were better back in those times. On the other hand, I don't think this is the fundamental problem though. Like, okay, we just spent a couple of minutes complaining about how there's a lot of trash on all these stores. Um, but I do think on the one hand, that's obviously true. On the other hand, if the route to solving that is like, oh, there ought to be a law against this or whatever, right? You get into weird protectionism that I think doesn't actually help people really. And so it's a nuanced problem, right? And I think, I think the right way to solve it is for individual stores to decide what the voice of their store is. That's definitely one thing that Nintendo definitely always has had is like, there's like a voice of Nintendo, like Nintendo things are a certain way, you know? And um, that's not true on Steam, for example, right? right. Yeah, it's so, like the ultimate libertarian marketplace theme, you know, which, yeah. is, which is cool. It's cool. I mean, there should be some of that, but when that's everything, I don't know. But but I guess what I want to say is um, I don't feel like that's really the fundamental problem. I think the fundamental problem is just a bunch of other problems on the production side that we haven't taken seriously enough. And um, they sort of add up to an entire industry that's mostly not making interesting things mm -hmm. or that's not able to make interesting things. Let's put it mm -hmm. that way. Even if they wanted to. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. You. Yeah. Well, 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 that's the thing is, is so when I think about how can I do my little part to improve the game industry, right? It's always going to be on the production side. It's never going to be like, try to risk constrain what people can have because I don't, I don't think that ends well. Even if I do think it's a problem, I don't think it ends well to try to solve that problem and 
in in a general way. Yeah. So yeah. so I just try to make the best games that I can, um, and try to do what I can technically to clean up the mess. I was writing down here in my notes, like what you're saying. It's interesting because it's some of our posture, not you and me, but me and maybe others is, is somewhat reactionary in that it, you can't like, I look at the iPhone for instance, and like the early iPhone era as a really damaging portion of the games of games history that had t- tons of splash damage on everything. And we could have done something about it. Maybe we didn't, but maybe it's very reactionary that you just can't fight against these, these marketplaces. Um, but back to your, tweet I, I to go through some of these so you had mentioned this but 2021 over hiring and you yeah. and i both kind of smirked about this yeah. what what do you think about this because i i went a little 4d chess with this over time and and i don't know if i'm just over like over my skis here at all but i'm wondering if a lot of these big companies they're not are they that stupid or do they look at it and think Maybe this is a way for us to kind of hedge and be able to purge maybe eight quarters down the road, a bunch of expensive people and we can kind of bloat and then say, look how big we've become. Now we need to lay people off. I mean, um, well, okay. So that's, that's a whole other point. If you want to, if you want to write down points, we can get to about why games are having a problem, like how much it costs to pay people, especially programmers again, has gone way up, but we we can come back to that. Um, Okay. Are, are the people doing this stupid? I don't know. Probably not, usually. Um, I mean, I couldn't have predicted what was going to happen when, when we were in 2020 or 2021. Um, but there are a couple of different forces that combine, probably more than a couple, but a couple that are easy to point out, right? Um, one is just, again, a lot of people were at home more and doing internet things. So there was this whole boom in the internet, right? Um, the other thing that happened is we kind of wrecked the U S economy by printing all this money. Mm. Right. And the thing is that, um, like generally observable inflation in terms of prices that people pay for things, uh, kind of starts later, right? I'm not an economist, so I'm I'm not going to try to explain this or even claim that I have a super good understanding of it, but you know, what we had in 2020, to 2021, 2021 especially, was a big like boom in stock prices, for example, right? Um, and really what that was, was a, a leading edge of inflation showing itself, right? Because if, you, if there's just a lot more dollars out there and people want to use those dollars, they invest in stuff, right, to, to make a profit. And those investments drive up the price, right, because there's someone else willing to buy it. So you have to pay a little more than that person to buy it, right? And so instead of being, um, this is my understanding of this situation, is that instead of being some kind of organic boom based on the merit of the companies, which was also happening because these companies were posting better numbers because of everybody staying at home, um, it was also due to just, uh, how would you say it? Um, just the, the increased supply of dollars, right? So, you know, if it costs $10 to buy, uh, I'm trying, I said, it, I was thinking a sandwich, that would be, actually now that would, that's about a correct price. Mm-hmm. Um, a few years ago, that would be a ridiculous number, but if it costs $10 to buy a sandwich and then you print $1 for every dollar that exists, it will cost $20 to buy a sandwich because there's a certain amount of dollars and a certain amount of goods and prices are a result of that equation, right? Prices are how many dollars are there per good and then how much do people value goods relative to each other, Right. And so stock prices went way up, but that made these companies think they were doing really well, doing better than. So, so they look like they were doing better because of all the people staying at home. And you always want to extrapolate that curve upward, right? Indefinitely into the future. And nobody wants to say, oh, it's going to go down again next year. This is the new normal, right? We, mm-hmm. Everybody does a lot more Amazon delivery now. And there's all these like more services that are designed for you to be at home. People are just going to be at home more. So my company is going to do better. But then also your stock price goes up because dollars are worth less. So 
it just looked really good. And if your plan is to plan for the future based on those projections, it's, it's very easy to get wrong, right? So, uh, yeah, um, I mean, almost everybody did get it wrong. <clears throat> oh, but, but then the third thing was interest rates were still very low, right? Mm -hmm. Because inflation hadn't hit yet. And <clears throat> we had been in this zero interest rate regime for a long time. And so people were really used to it. Like early on when it's kind of cheap to borrow money and, and do a lot with it, um, you're still hesitant to because you're used to the behavior patterns from before that, where it's just like, oh, it's costly to borrow money or whatever. But the more you get into this period when like money was basically free, um, the easier it is to just raise a bunch of debt and we'll pay it off later because it, it doesn't matter. Um, it's going uh, for anyone who plays escape from Tarkov. It's like going to the flea market in Tarkov. You find something valuable, even if you need it, you can sell it now because you can buy it later for the same price or less. Right. So, um, all these things were happening and it, it really, um, it really was a very loose economy that was not tethered to reality in several fundamental ways. And I, I, it feels to me like that's still how it is. It's just, we've got inflation and higher interest rates now, and that's changing some things, but a lot of companies are just kind of like not really doing anything real and have a tremendous number of employees relative to what they actually do, you know? And, and I think a lot of that just has to shake out because it always does eventually. Um, and that might be very painful when it does. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. There's um, the inflation question comes up a lot on our show because I've made the argument, people freaked out about the 60 to $70 jump in triple a game pricing for some games like playstation exclusives and mm. i'm like that's that doesn't even really make up for the inflationary pressure that has gone no. on in the in the interim None, so now they're behind the eight ball again oh and yeah, yeah they I already mean, played it, their hand in some sense you know it's this becomes really amusing when you project it back to the 90s or 80s and you say like what did a game cost then and extrapolate that to now and it's like two hundred dollars yeah right? it's totally I, I tell people all the time i paid eighty dollars <laughs> for final fantasy three slash six on snes when i was yeah. 10 in, in toys r us and people can't believe it and i i always bring up the example i remember seeing fantasy star 4 for 99.99 on genesis in 95 and that was people th that was a lot of money but people didn't say like oh my god i can't believe how, how can you charge so much for it they just understood that that was the cost of doing business i don't think a lot of people realize how much games have gotten better in quotes and how much more affordable they become accessible longer more replay value i'm buying i'm buying Mega Man 3 for 50 or 60 dollars on nes and i'm beating it in an hour you know it's like i don't understand there's a huge disc i'll tell you jonathan it's one of my big frustrations on our show is the huge disconnect that people have between games and value and I they mean, just I, think things should be free and I don't or cheap. And I just don't agree. I think they well, should be reasonably priced to make them sustainable. Games are very, very expensive to make. <laughs> so like in order for them to be cheap, you have to sell a huge number of them. Right. And selling a huge number means you have to be very conservative. So if you want games that are creative and doing something interesting, you know, they can't be five dollars because those people will not be able to make a living. Um, on the other hand, if I side with the, the gamers who are complaining about prices, like I just don't want to play that many games. Again, maybe, um, maybe it's because I've played too many games and am uh, jaded, but I also just think games today are not um, relative to what else is out there in the world, like what else people could do with their time and attention and their thoughts. Um, Games are not any more as overwhelmingly compelling of a proposition as a way to spend your time. Just because, you know, why do that when you can instead go argue and make death threats at somebody on, on Twitter or something, right? And it can be this all-consuming, emotional, you know, rage uh, uh, absorption exercise. Um, hmm. And, and most games are actually pretty boring. Like it, it seems like most game design these days is like, here's a to-do list, do all the items on the to-do list. <laughs> and like, and, and these items are not necessarily that hard to do in most games. And like, 
there's a lot of reasons for that, why game design converges on that. But it's just very boring to me. And I don't want to play most of these games. And so because I don't want to play them, they're not worth that much to me, even though they're very expensive to produce, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the other end of this, is what people may really be saying, even if they don't think they agree with me, right? When I say this kind of thing, that games are boring, all these people say, oh, they're not boring. They're so exciting. But then like, okay, but do you not want to pay $60, $70, $80 for this game? that you play for freaking 200 hours, as you say, why not? It must not actually be very valuable to you mm -hmm. if you're not willing to pay that money. Well said. Um, so what's going on? It is a little confusing. Um, I'm not claiming to really fully understand the phenomenon at play here, uh, but the, it's, it is pretty weird. <laughs> it is pretty weird. The other thing it might be is just, Again, due to the heightened availability of all these games, um, a lot of them are on sale all the time to try to get people's attention. So, you know, if there is a $5 game over there that's like only eight months old, why would you buy the $60, $70, $80, $100 game, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. If you have patience. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so then everybody pivots to like live service games with free to play or low entry point, And then everyone gets fatigued of those because there's 2 million of them and most of them are bad, right? So it's complicated. It's very complicated what's happening. And I don't have the answer. All I can do is just sit down, keep my head down and make games that are good and we'll see what happens when they come out. The next thing you had said in your, in your tweet that I'm reading here that I think is yeah. very interesting is uh, unproductive remote work. Yes. Now, I, I think I I want to hear so much more about this from you because I think it's so fascinating when yeah. uh, Last Stand is fully remote. And it's funny because we acknowledge up front to our audience, and I've said this on Sacred Symbols in the past, I'm like, imagine Sacred Symbols at being its best being 100%, right? Uh, we're not at our best when we're not together doing the show. Yeah. But we make the sacrifice of, say, maybe it being 90% as good as it can be so that everyone is happy where they want to be and they get more fulfillment out of their lives or whatever we, in other words, we know we're sacrificing the product a little bit to do that. Yeah. Um, it's weird to me to pretend that there is no sacrifice to remote work because there has to be some sort of sacrifice. I would just rather a worse product and happier people than a better product and unhappy people. Um, so uh, I that's wonder, a legitimate trade-off. Yeah. Um, yeah. On the other hand, I'm not sure that that's that obvious that people are happier this way. I think it depends a lot on the person and on the team and on the surrounding social environment, right? I've definitely, you know, running a 15 person studio for as many years as I've had it. I mean, it's grown slowly over time, but I've definitely, um, you have a number of people who quit or get fired or whatever. And so you observe all these things. And sometimes I feel like people have quit because the work is somehow, um, I mean, if, if you spend a substantial amount of your time working, you want that to be engaging. You want to care about what you're doing. You want to feel to some extent fulfilled by what you're doing, right? And the, the paradox about this that's not polite to say in the discourse or whatever um, is that often working hard is a component of that because if you're if you're proud of what you do, not like super hard, like not working yourself to the bone, but like putting in a real effort, right? Like, I I want this game, this part of this game to be good. I'm really gonna like put my energy and attention into making it good, like as opposed to just like phoning it in and only kind of you know d d barely doing the minimum, right? Um, because if you're if if your life attitude is, you know, I'm kind of working this job, but I'm really only doing the bare minimum and I'm not that engaged in all these things. It's just hard to be happy. Like it's hard to have self-respect because you know, you're just like kind of conning people and whatever. That's one end of a spectrum. Right. And mm -hmm. so the problem is even if you hire people who want to be motivated who really are interested in the kind of thing that you're making and who love games and really want to be engaged making things. Human beings are human beings. And there's part of the human organism that like responds to seeing other people doing things 
and like seeing that guy over there and like, oh, he's working on the thing. So I'm, I'm going to be diligent and work on my part because we're together and doing this. Right. And that's not just intellectual. It's, it's like the lower parts of your brain that you don't understand. And it doesn't work that well um, with a distributed team. And so I feel like, and again, I, I haven't, um, you know, these would be kind of difficult conversations to have with people uh, who quit in an honest way. Right. But um, I think that at least in a couple of cases, it has been that people were not that engaged because of their remoteness and because like I wasn't pushing them uh, to be as productive as they would be in person, actually. And I think, I think, pe I don't know, this is again, like, th this is something people are going to get mad at me for saying, I'm not, I'm not talking about crunch at all. Our studio doesn't crunch. Um, but there's a malaise that can happen. Like, here's the thing. Computers are inherently kind of depressing, actually, um, because you're sitting just in front of this weird technological box. It's not really, you know, I was talking earlier about how, like, Twitter is a rage farm and whatever. But, like, I think that's not exactly a coincidence. People will say, oh, it's because they're optimizing for engagement or whatever. And I think that's true. But I think also computers are depressing. Um, and I say that as someone who's been a computer programmer since the age of 10. Um, I've spent a lot of time in front of computers and I just know how they are. And if you're at least in an environment with other people, um, it maybe offsets that a little bit. Right. And, and that doesn't happen as much at home. I don't feel like I'm making a very coherent case here. Maybe I should have thought about this before the conversation, no, but I think there's, just, I mean there's a lot of thoughts about this that all just kind of swirl around. But so here's, here's a situation is we used to be a mostly local company um, based in San Francisco and we would have a few remote people um, and we would fly them in every few months and have everybody in one place because we wanted to increase that team cohesion. Right now we are fully remote. Um, and tactically speaking, I don't see how a company of my size could go back to local, uh, because that's not the world that we're in. I think we would have to grow to be a much bigger company. And that like changes a lot of things. We do still fly everybody in for three months. And so we see the difference very, or every three months, I mean, for one week, and that's actually next week. And the difference is quite stark, I think, in terms of uh, productivity, um, people's mood, uh, how well they understand each other. Like you, we all fly into the office and it's like a light switch turns on. Right. And then everybody goes home and the light slowly kind of goes out <laughs> and then three months later it comes on again. Right. And it is just very hard to deny when you see this directly, but a lot of people don't want to believe it because here's the thing. People want to work at home and just have a more convenient time and not get in a car and not whatever. Um, but I think even people who think they like that, I think the long-term effect is maybe something they're not admitting or not, or, or not willing to grapple with. So even for me, so this is all a little bit paradoxical because I work the best on my own in part because I run the company. So when I'm around, everybody wants to bug me to like know something and just the, the pressure of whatever are the bigger long-term strategic issues of like making the company successful is like there. So even when we're in the office, I would often like sneak out and go work at a coffee shop or whatever. Um, so there are also individual differences, but broadly speaking, I think most people are more productive and happier when they're working in an office with other people. And I've just seen that play out over and over. Um, even me when, you know, right now I live in, um, Colorado somewhere and, um, which is far away from most other people on the team. Um, I don't usually work from this office here because it's isolating. I usually go out and like work at a coffee shop or something where there just at least are people doing stuff around me and in the background because it's less depressing. Right. And mm -hmm. that's just important. And I don't know. I don't know how to deal with any of this. It's difficult, but um, I do think that companies take a substantial 
hit from being remote. Uh, you said 90% a minute ago. Um, I think the bigger the team is, the more of the hit, but also there may be something about the nature of the creative work of a game. Like, you know, I imagine, I don't know what your situation is like from day to day, but I imagine that everybody is on the same page about like what the podcast is and what you're doing and all that, or at least differences are not that big. Yeah, because yeah, we're all, yeah. know it's established and mm-hmm. it's like, it's an iterative thing where it's like, we're do, do the next episode, do the next episode. Yeah. We actually have, we're actually very decentralized. All the shows kind of just happen. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think the structure of what you're doing helps with that with something like a game where there needs to be so much communication to establish a shared understanding of what you're even doing. It's just, it's just hard. It's just hard. It, it is interesting how <laughs> it's funny. I remember this when I, when I, when I graduated college and um, IGN offered me a job, I originally tried to make it remote so that yeah. I could go to grad school and they weren't, that was like not a thing that they were going to even consider. This was back in 2007. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, now fast forward. And it seems like it's a huge point of leverage that people have almost this expectation. Like COVID had this, this, all this destruction and destructive qualities. But one, the one thing people did felt like it did is it gave them their time back. And then they never, and I understand that they, they don't want to relinquish that because they understand that it didn't necessarily have to be that way, which I think will always be in the back of their minds. But I'm also of the mind that you kind of want what you don't have in some sense. Like my wife and I work together. You talked to her when we set this, this podcast up and, mm-hmm. uh, and we're together at home all the time in our house with our dogs and we go out and walk the dogs and hang out. But we, we often say that we're going feral. We say that <laughs> to each other, you know, yeah. because we don't have to really interact with anyone. Any, like we don't have to do many of the things that we used to have to do in, in, in the real world. And sometimes I wonder, should I, I wouldn't do this to the guys, but, and girls, but it's like, should I say like, we're, we're going to do this in a, in a studio in Virginia here where I live. And it's like, I just, like you said, I think we have something very unique and bespoke. That's a lot that, that works in, a, in this very decentralized way, but I couldn't imagine making a game of a size remotely either. Um, yeah. So that's so interesting to, to, to think about that. What do you think about people kind of taking that they people stumbled into this reality, I guess, during COVID that this could be a reality that they don't have to go to the office anymore. They don't want to let it go. You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, yeah, like, obviously that's true. Obviously. Obviously it is, it is more convenient to, an individual on any particular day to just stay at home. Mm. Yeah, totally. Obviously. Uh, But the question is, does that result in games that are like, okay, firstly, what you could ask the question in less of a leading way, like what effect does that have on the quality of a game that results from that kind of process and the time that it takes to make the game, which translates into how expensive it is it. Um, now, a lot of people who are doing motivated arguing will say, oh, it makes the games better. It makes them way better because people can be more efficient because they don't have to travel and all. You'll hear all sorts of people say that on the internet, but then like, look at what's coming out. Is that really true? <laughs> that that it's better you know um i don't think it is um if it were we would see it by now um from you know my observation at my company is that we have to do a lot to try to make up for being remote and we're not able to do it completely right so i think we take a quality hit and Mm. the question for me is since i'm aiming for the highest quality of thing that i could make um Am I making a mistake by allowing the team to be fully remote? Because we're going to miss, if we miss quality by 10%, that's actually terrible, right? Because that's our number one thing that we care about, right? Right, I spend, I don't care about money, obviously. Like I set fire to giant piles of money like every day to run this company. Um, So, yeah, I don't know. It's just hard. I um, I don't know how to deal with it. And 
I don't, I don't want, you know, I don't want this podcast also to be full of me just saying a bunch of depressing negative things. So at the same time, I mean, we are managing to make stuff that's good. And actually the other thing that I would say, <laughs> I'm about to flip the coin to negative again. That was like a half a sentence of non-negativity. Um, it's not like if you look at these bigger companies that are largely in office, like they're doing very well right now either, Right. Because there are all these other factors that that come into play um, that have caused things to be a problem. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What I do think is, you know, we're talking here about relatively short-term observations of trends. And the the way that I can warm my heart back up, like, after making all these negative observations is just that, um, over longer timescales, things often become surprising again, right? Like in the short term, you observe some trend about what's happening over the past couple of years or whatever, but then you zoom out to a 15 or 20 year timescale and you end up in a place you couldn't have predicted. And our job as people shaping the industry, I think, is to try to make sure that that's a good place. And actually, you know, one of the things one of the things that I think is wrong a little bit about all the things I just said is I've been speaking about this mostly as someone who doesn't have agency. Like these are, are large macroeconomic trends and large social trends, and I can't do anything about them. I can do a little bit about them. I can, I could make, if I really wanted an in-office company, um, I could at least try that and it might fail because you almost couldn't hire anybody. Um, but maybe the people you could hire would be really good. Um, I don't know. Uh, but, but the point being, you know, what, after all this like belly aching and grousing about how hard things are and maybe they will be, and maybe, maybe a lot of companies are going to go out of business this year and maybe even next year. Um, but that's, that's just part of a cycle. And at some point we'll end up somewhere interesting that we couldn't have predicted. And maybe it'll be a positive place. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny, man. I, I think you and I both agree. And, and it's such an interesting point philosophically that I think a lot of people miss, which is that you can't have your cake and eat it too with remote work. It just comes with sacrifice. Like, I just think some people are very hard headed and saying like, no, there is no sacrifice. Like it's an objectively good thing. And I'm like, no, it's a subjectively good thing, depending on what's more important to you or how you structure things. So I think you and I agree on that. Um, the yeah. next thing you had said here, which I thought was interesting was that the shift towards hiring people for reasons besides ability. And this gets yeah. into a lot of things, although I think you spoke about it a little bit earlier. It's just like the bloat and bureaucracy of making games. My brother and I do a retro podcast together in our network, and we often res we often reflect on, though the games were much more rudimentary, how quickly games were made and how small the teams were. Yes. Like, how is a game like Final Fantasy IV made in nine months? That seems crazy, <laughs> you know? Like, that, how, how is yes. that even possible? Um, yes. And they did it with, like, 10 people or something like that. And I don't think we should go towards the AAA development that Naughty Dog tried for a while. It's like where we don't have producers and... You know, it's like very willy nilly and you got to have some structure. You have to have some intermediary people, people that don't make the game, but organize. I get it. But yeah. w what do you mean by this when you say people that are hired for reasons besides ability? Is it the bureaucracy? Is it the bloat? Is it something else? It is several factors all at once. And this is going to touch on political issues. So I'll try not to be overly political in the way I discuss it. But I, I do think when these things touch on like, an, an entire industry's ability to operate, we need to be able to talk about them, right? Um, so let's just talk about programming again, right? There's been some generational shift. So when when I was learning programming, um, I'm pretty, I'm an oldster, right? But when I was in college and stuff, there was this culture of programming that was a little bit toxic, would be the modern word for it. We wouldn't have said that back then. But it was like, always trying to prove that you're the smartest person and that you know everything and whatever. And, and there were negative aspects to that, but the, there were positive aspects to it as well because it resulted in people trying to be good. And you like, you don't go 
to the Olympics to compete in swimming if you never tried to be good in swimming, right? Like that's just not how that works. If you're going to go to the Olympics, you have to try really, really hard for a really long time daily, right? And so it results in people who are good and there's probably less toxic ways to do that. And engineering the culture a little bit differently uh, would, would be a good idea. But we seem to have, you know, thrown the baby out with the bathwater and been like, you know, starting sometime around the zero interest rate era, you know, after 2008, um, I started seeing a lot of people who were like managers at companies posting on the internet saying stuff like, you know, programming is really a social job. It's about how well you get along with the rest of the team and, and you know, how good people feel in the office. And like, okay, on the one hand, yes, that is a component of it. And if somebody's like a complete jerk to literally everybody and makes everybody hate coming into their job, you probably shouldn't hire that guy or you should fire him if you already hired him. But that's an extreme case, right? But what you find is all these people, like w there's this disease of the internet, which is that we're listening to ourselves say stuff. It's like going, going crazy with all the talking that everybody's doing all the time. And because there's so much talking, very little of that talking is tested against reality. It's just a bunch of talking that occurs in, in nowhere. And so everyone convinces themselves that this talking is right. And they're just like smelling their own farts all day. Right. So, um, so people start hiring according to this, right. And you just, because there's so much free money again, you know, largely in more like the web space. Cause the, the web, the World Wide web was exploding at that time. Nobody says that anymore. Nobody says the World yeah. Wide Web. But that's what, what, what Web 1.0 now is what they kind of. I don't kinda, even know. Yeah, yeah, but it's just the internet now, right? Right. And everybody spends most of their time on a website. But um, yeah, because there was so much free money available, the fact that I think hiring was becoming less effective in terms of the average programmer being hired was less good. Um, mm. It didn't matter as much because it was made up for by all the free money, right? And now money isn't so free. There's still, it's still too free, I'm afraid to say. I agree with you completely. But, I can't believe that they're talking about lowering the rates next, next quarter. It's like, you got to keep dude, raising the rates. You know? Joe Biden today was like, hey man, we're going to pay off a bunch of student loans. Yeah, it's great. More money. Court More free money. We couldn't, right? Yeah. It's like, it's nuts. So um, that that's election year stuff, right? Totally. Okay. But that's what's so fucked up about it is because the Fed isn't supposed to act politically, but it's clearly acting politically. Oh, yeah. You yeah, know? Yeah. No. Um, so, so all that, the economy is still really miscalibrated, right? The problem is it could stay miscalibrated for longer than you can remain solvent or even alive, right? And so you kind of have to just operate within that while it's that way. Um, hmm. But but also, okay, so to get a little political again, right? And by the way, feel free to get political. Our show gets political uh, I, when it's appropriate. No, so no, no. I, I, I actually have no problem getting political. The problem is just I don't want to be like generically political and sure. say the same crap that you could hear anybody say on Twitter or whatever, right? Um, I'm going to try to have a more nuanced take on it, which is just, again, around, oh, let's say 2014 or whatever, 2013. Um, there was a much bigger push for like inclusivity in the game industry that a lot of people are familiar with who, who lived through the dawning of those times. And I don't mind that idea in, in the broad sense, like keeping people out. So like gatekeeping became a bad word approximately with millennials or something, right? Like the first time... I would hear all sorts of people saying, oh, this person's a gatekeeper in a negative way. And I've been called, you know, a gatekeeper in a negative way by people who had no idea what the hell they were talking about. Right. <clears throat> and so it's this insult that sort of reveals that the culture was about everybody should be let into everything. Mm. Right. <clears throat> and the problem is that the way you maintain quality and trust is by not really letting everybody in is by having high standards, right? 
Um, and so I think when you're hiring for jobs, you, you should have very high standards about somebody's ability to perform that job, right? Um, is this person a good programmer? Are they a good environment artist? Are they a good producer, right? That already is very difficult to determine, actually. Um, you know, when you interview people, trying to hire people, it's, it's very challenging to try to figure out, is this person actually going to be good at all? But especially in the context of our company or whatever, because there's so many ways to be misled and, and be wrong. Now, once you start operating according to a culture of inclusivity, which again, um, there may be positive aspects to that, but the negative aspect is that you inherently start caring less about merit and people's ability to, to do this job, right? And everybody says that's not true when they're defending these practices, right? Because they have to say it's not true because otherwise they would have to deal with the fact that it is true, but it is true. Like as soon as you have other criteria, whatever they are, mm -hmm. um, I only want to hire people who are taller than six feet tall or whatever, right? Um, that's going to result in me hiring people on average who are less good at the job than if I hired people regardless of how tall they are, right? right. Agreed. And so, so the thing is, again, especially in 2020 to 2021, when there's all these free money and the culture had shifted. So, so companies are not only hiring a tremendous number of people, but they're hiring according to um, practices that are the least merit-based that they've ever been. And those people are kind of chilling at home and not really acclimating to the company culture or anything like that. And the result of all these things together, I think, is a substantial deterioration in companies' ability to make games effectively. Like it's just, um, it's just, yeah. I it's don't know. it seems crazy to me that a comp that a company would hire. It seems it just seems so crazy to me that a company that's not beholden to some sort of bureauc new bureaucratic standard or a DEI standard or whatever it might be. Yeah would not want to hire towards the end goal of making the most amount of money. That That's why it's so, it's so strange to me. I also think that when you hire for talent and I'm just using our company as an example, you hire, you end yeah. up with a pretty elaborate group of people. Our company is substantially more diverse than our competitors. And we totally. didn't hire for that reason, but we ended up with two black people and an Asian guy and, uh, and a Latino guy. It's like, because that's just kind of the way it would mix up anyway. So, yeah. But because I no, want to totally. make, I, I'm yeah. earnest, I want to make the most amount of money. I mean, that's it, why it, you do it. It's very weird. Yeah. It's very weird. Like we've also had a huge amount of diversity over the years, and um, but it comes from hiring in a merit based way, right? And so, yeah, I don't know. But here's the thing. So you just said you would think that companies want to make the most money, and it's this weird paradox of capitalism, actually that most of the time they don't. And this is a mystery that we have yet to unravel. And I think when we do, we'll under, I don't know, maybe we'll fix some stuff about the modern economy, right? But even ignoring hiring for a second, well, it, it's related to hiring, but on the other end. So ignoring the question of who you hire, if you look at a big company like, you know, I don't know, Facebook or whatever, one of the things I've been trying to get people to understand um, or let's use um, Facebook actually recently did some stuff where they downsized a little bit and said, we're going to get a lot more picky about who we hire or who stays at the company, right? This was a famous speech that Mark Zuckerberg gave lately. So they may no longer be such a relevant example, but pick any generic tech company that was getting all this free money as the internet was exploding. Um, here's the thing. <clears throat> According to basic economics, if you produce some product, right, your profit is the money you make from selling it minus how much it costs to produce, right? And in all these technology companies, the number one cost of production is paying the salaries of the people at the company. And so you would think that these companies are incentivized to produce the most with the smallest teams. 
but that's not what they do like at all. Right. Instead they explode. They're always like hiring as much as they can afford actually. And there are a few reasons for that. I think one of them is, well, there's a lot of reasons for it. One of them is the basic power law nature of the internet, where sometimes like the biggest player wins the whole pot. And so there's an incentive to grow. Um, and that is still in line with what you were saying about making the most money. Um, but there's other things like if you're in this venture capital environment and you're trying to get, you know, millions or billions of dollars from venture capitalists, you want to look successful. And one way to look successful is to grow, right? So there's an incentive to do that, even if the growth is ultimately not totally necessary, objectively speaking. Um, that's a little bit complicated because what really gets VCs interested is like, you know, the re growing revenue numbers. And so there's some, there would have to be some thesis there about having more employees lets you pump those numbers sooner, which it probably does. But nevertheless, like if you were trying, if you were looking at a profit per employee basis, it would be a lot better not to do that explosive growth most of the time because you end up with so many people, right? Um, but really, I think the thing that is most pathological and is actually maybe even a bigger factor than either of those things is that internally to the company, um, you have incentives that are misaligned with the incentives of the company as a whole. So for example, suppose you're a manager at generic technology company. What do you want? You want to be paid well, first of all. That's already against the, the naive interest of the company, which in principle would like to not pay you a huge amount, but instead they're giving you um, all this stock and stuff so that you feel paid well. Um, but what, what is your incentive? Well, you want to use up the budget that the company gives you. And in fact, you want to grow it. And to do that, you have to spend that whole budget every year. And you want to feel like your career trajectory year upon year is increasing. You want to become a VP of the company or whatever, or to, you know, um, be responsible for more things. And so you want a larger and larger team of people under you in order to feel that you are successful in your career. And so you have these companies full of people who are all trying to do the same thing, which is have responsibility over more people who report to them. Right. And it, so it's like having all these cancerous growths inside the company, actually. Um, and there's very little incentive to keep things lean and to um, operate efficiently, except when hard times come along. And then, then everybody's like, oh my God, we got to operate efficiently. But the problem is you trained everybody in the company to operate inefficiently and that's who you've got. And turning that ship is very hard, right? It's very hard. You have to teach people to do essentially different jobs than what you taught them to do already. Right. Yeah. It's, um, I remember my, my games media days being in the office in San Francisco, even then when we were a few hundred people and just looking around being like at least one third of the, you don't do anything here. Yeah. Uh, which even at 22, 23, 24 years old bothered the shit out of me. Cause these were the same people that would give like, to your point earlier, uh, to, would give like, you know, employees reviews at every quarter or whatever, and literally say things to me like you're, you work too much and it makes us look bad kind of shit, you know, or you're, you can't, it's almost like, why are you here during TGS or why are you know, <laughs> at midnight to do things? It's like, cause I care. Yeah. Cause my name's on it. Cause yeah. I want to be valuable. I want to get promoted. I want to get paid more. And, uh, it, it's just so weird that a company even of scale yeah. couldn't go to its employees and be like, listen, we all know that a third of you don't do any work. Uh, we're going to lay a third of you or, or aren't useful to our organization. We're going to lay a third of you off. Some of those responsibilities will go to others here. We're going to give each of you that remain a 20% raise and, uh, we'll still save money. You yeah. know, like it's, it, to me, it's just so strange that God, it, publicly traded companies, especially, and this is what you're really speaking about annoy me so bad because they just it's just so frivolous and wasteful yeah. no there's a spectrum there's always at those bigger companies a bunch of people who do nothing but then there's like a next tranche of people who do like some things but meh, you know and then it goes there and there there's a thing called price's law um 
which is an observation about companies generally. And it says that um, the square root of the number of employees is how many people do half the work of the company, right? So if there's a hundred person company, 10 people do half the work. Wow. And this is, it sounds extreme, but this is generally observed as being true in, in most cases. And I don't know, that just indicates huge inefficiencies and you, you kind of wish that we knew how to fix that. Right. Yeah. And I do think there are, there are rare cases where, where you do get a group of committed people who really care about what they're doing and, and that number improves by a lot. But those also tend to be um, uh, temporary, right? Like after after some, usually you get success if you get people together like that, because of course, and then with success, things tend to grow and you lose the, you lose the same magic, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so, it's so interesting how that stands in the stark contrast to this notion that in America, for instance, we have this unfettered cutthroat capitalism where it's like, mm, if a company is over hiring so significantly and knowing it, that's something else, which yeah, is, so, no, and, then, and then, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, it's just, if you look at what companies actually do, it is often very hard to square that with this idea that they're trying to make the most money, right? Because the behavior, the behavior is often very weird. Of course, there's confirmation bias you can have, or you can look at, you know, some things and explain them that way. But very often, it's just a complicated dynamical system where like weird stuff happens. Yeah. And it's not, I mean, it's, it, I think it's not good, but I, it seems hard to fix. Yeah, totally. And by the way, when companies, I, I'm, I'm always so fascinated when companies like Twitter really go against the grain, just lay almost everyone off basically, and still run and operate with a 10th of their employees or something like that. It almost indicates exactly what you're saying towards uh, this price is law. But at the same time, people are so, they don't, I don't know. They don't like, they don't like efficiencies. I guess it means fewer jobs and maybe more economic issues on the, on the ground. But I, I don't know. You know it depends on which side of things that you ask, right? Um, people like low prices. They like fewer ads on their free internet services, but they also, you know, want people, <clears throat> they also want people to be paid well. And, um, you know, again, it's, it's pretty popular to be very left wing and almost have this attitude that a company is supposed to be like a jobs program for people. Right. Right. Like that's the way it's seen a lot of the time. And like both of those things can't really coexist. Right. Like if, if the goal of a company is to pay as many people as possible, as much money as possible, then prices go to infinity. Like that's just what that means. And people have to grasp both ends of that stick and like see the whole thing and understand. And they often don't want to. So <laughs> it is what it is. Well, this gets into the next thing you had said, which is a generational shift towards disillusionment and nihilism and a refusal to find meaning in work. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Yeah. But I do find that there is definitely a relationship between the nihilism. It's a per- perfect word for it because I knew people like that in my in my corporate life. Yeah. And they're kind of it, there's a relationship between that and kind of your uselessness towards the organization and that it's kind of the way you're supposed to be. It's like, yeah. I, I graphed this on the people that type in all lowercase letters on Twitter. Yes. These are the, ex- these are the exact kinds of people I'm talking about. Like they, you know, you know exactly who I'm talking <laughs> Not about. Not just lowercase letters. Like they say you are for your and whatever. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's, it's very strange. It's just very strange to me to, want to live in that world of disillusionment. Well, here's the thing. This is, this is a large problem. I think the internet amplified it, but it's been going on certainly from before the internet, like, you know, it's been going on for decades and decades, like certainly, um, to pick just one department of it, right. The population of the USA used to be much more religious than it is today, for example. And that's one way of 
seeing the world and seeing life in a way that there's meaning, right? Um, and that's much less true now. And that was a cultural shift that occurred and I saw it occur. And um, there was really weird stuff going on. So like there was some kind of um, like, you know, especially if you're trying to be a smart person, like you're a college educated person or whatever, there was this weird cultural idea that the smart people are all atheists. And if you're religious, you're dumb. And, and that idea uninvestigated by itself um, just convinced people, I think, or whatever. It, it, but actually, if you go back, like the real, a lot of the real smart people who like invented the modern world were all intensely religious or had their own private spirituality or whatever. One of the lines of research that I did uh, for The Witness, you know, there's all these audio logs in there, but they're not fictional. They're like from history. Um, they're, they, they include writings of physicists and philosophers and people like that. And so one of the things I did is I spent a bunch of time reading stuff written by uh, a bunch of the people who figured out quantum mechanics. And those guys had a lot of different beliefs and, you would be a fool to think that they were all like generic atheists in the way that you think of today. Right. But, but yet everybody is somehow convinced that, that the smart people are like generic atheists. So that's, that's one dimension of it. Right. Um, but there are many other dimensions. Like we decided that we're too smart to believe that art should be beautiful and inspiring. And instead, you know, you can have a horse crap in the middle of the gallery and that's, that's art. And, um, you know, tape the banana to the wall or whatever. Um, so that's another dimension, but also just, you know, let me, let me ask you a question here, right? So you probably have some idea of what you're trying to do in life to be good and successful, right? Mm -hmm. And I can ask this, even asking this in the way I'm about to is going to sound anachronistic, which will show you how far you went. But if you want to be a good man, right, in life, there's some picture that you have of what that would look like, right? And the question I have for you is, how did you get that picture? Did you have to build it up kind of yourself from scraps? Or did our culture transmit it to you in a direct and clear way? And what I would argue is it's more the former. It's like you can find little pieces of it or whatever, but we've sort of given up the idea that there's a good way to live. You're just supposed to wing it, man. And I'm very touchy about this topic because I did not have a very good upper, like neither of my parents were uh, very helpful at all in terms of figuring out how to operate in the world. So I didn't have that guidance. So it was literally like just what I absorbed from the culture around me as I, as a kid that I was figuring out how you should be in the world. And it's just totally mess, messed up chaos. I mean, it was back then, like today it's even worse. Right. And so I feel bad for anyone who's in a position like I was and has to just like figure it out. It took me forever to figure, not that I've totally figured it out even now, but I mean, I was like probably at least 35 before I started like really, um, really figuring out some principles that really could lead to a long-term successful life. And the thing is though, isn't that sort of supposed to be the job of a culture is to transmit the information that helps people be successful both within the culture and within the world. But we've decided that that's not a good thing to do. Um, maybe that's a little bit gendered because it sure seems like there's a lot of telling women how they should be. Um, whether that's, you know, from several different directions and, you know, maybe some of that is accurate and maybe some of it is inaccurate. Right. But, um, apart from that, and that's only in certain dimensions, like career dimensions or whatever, lots of people will tell women how they should be, but like in terms of actually things that are more important, like what is life about and what, what should you believe in and how should you behave? Like we're now living in a complete vacuum almost like you have to find those things um, more locally somehow, right? Like in a smaller social group 
or in you somehow collide with friends who you gel with and you form like a shared ethos or something like that. And this is just very, I think, very demoralizing. And the problem is there might be some ways in which it's actually true that you're smarter if you're demoralized, because at least, you know, if you imagine some big military bureaucracy from the past that was constantly broadcasting state propaganda to its people and you blindly believe all that, you could be happy in the moment believing that stuff, but maybe you're also kind of dumb. But like, are we really smarter now? I mean, are we really not in a military bureaucracy that's constantly broadcasting state propaganda that most people believe, right? It's crazy. And, and so, um, but also we're not happy from day to day either. We're no, not no, getting that part language. of the deal. You're speaking you know? my language here. Yeah. So, so that's, so, so then to tie this yeah. back into the main discussion, of course, that's going to affect people's work life. If you don't have a life that make, helps you feel inspired and helps you find meaning. And if work is not part of that meaning, then again, you end up in this weird, you know, picture of work that people have on the internet, which is like, oh, you're a wage slave or you're tr it's work is only about trading your time for money. It's not about bettering yourself. It's not about learning about the thing that you're doing and improving yourself as a person. It's not about, um, you know, working together with other people to make something bigger than yourself. These are all things that people respond to and feel, feel meaning in. And we've decided that for the most part, most of that isn't a thing. There is, you know, corporate cultures locally do try to resurrect some of this because it's, it's in their interest to do so. Like if you, if they can try to convince you that you could feel meaning by making something bigger than yourself with your coworkers at that company. But of course the company down the road isn't like that. You know, it's just us that have right. this special thing. Right. But they have to do it locally because it's not in the culture now. There is like in, in mainstream American culture. And again, this is not true if you go to certain local areas, but in mainstream American culture, there isn't really respect for work and there isn't really, um, we've lost sight of these ways in which you can use work to help make yourself better. And that's bad. And of course, so of course people are not going to be that good at working on things, right? What do you expect? Yeah, it's well said. I, I also think there's so, it's so ironic in my opinion, a couple of the things you said, like the, in a way, only a society, a capitalistic society of great excess, maybe this is like the populist in me speaking, but only an excessive society can even have a group of disen deeply disenchanted people that the, the system still somehow works and functions, even though they don't really choose to be a participant in it. And the other yeah. thing is like with religion, I find this so interesting and I don't know if you're a religious person or not. I'm, I'm not, I grew up Catholic, but I'm not a religious person, but I become more spiritual, I would say as I've gotten older, but, and I think those are two different things, but what's funny, especially in American progressivism is that they are deeply religious. They just don't know it. You know, I've, I've said that for years. That's a, it's a very common thing to say now, but it's so funny that people judge others for having dogma and belief when their dogma and belief is frankly just as insane and manifest right. in front of us, but they act like it's not that. In well, other words, I guess a lot of people are more similar to each other than they think. Here's the thing though, is that that's the natural state of a human being is to believe stuff and not even be necessarily that motivated to picking apart those beliefs to find out if they're true. And there's probably a lot of reasons for that. But the thing is, it's actually very hard to, to really know what's true. I mean, this, this goes back to the ancient Greeks. They observed this, right? Like, how much of what you believe do you actually really know via confirmation of your own direct experience and, um, you know, senses. It's all, almost none, right? I mean, may, maybe if you count all the details of the world around you, like I know there's a tree outside my house, right? Whatever. But in terms of how we operate from day to day, like, you know, is there a war in Ukraine? I mean, 
you believe that because a lot of people told you that, right? Um, is there an institution called the Federal Reserve that prints all this money for the U.S.? I mean, you believe that. I've never been to the Federal Reserve. I've never, like, pushed the button on the money printer to watch it go, right. like, right? Um, so, so we have to operate in this realm of mostly unconfirmed facts that are just maintained by consensus. It's like we all believe in the Federal Reserve, or most people don't think about the Federal Reserve, but whatever. It's on every dollar bill, mm -hmm. so you should believe it. Um, you know, we all believe there's a war in Ukraine. Um, most of us do, <laughs> right? And it's maintained by consensus. So it's not that surprising if this consensus mechanism also includes things that actually aren't true. Because, because the things that we believe that are true uh, don't get included due to the presence of evidence. They get included due to uh, propagation of other people saying that it's true, right? I, I was trying to f formulate some better way to say that. But, no, I understand. Yeah. No, I totally understand. It's... Uh... And so, you know, oh, um, so to say that one, one thing is a religion or another thing is a religion, I think on the one hand, that's true. It's a useful lens to use and it's a useful observation to make. But the real problem is we're all in this weird place where um, probably most of what you believe isn't really true, you know? And so... Um, certainly it's probably wrong in nuances and details, but then maybe a lot of it's wrong uh, at a fundamental level. And that's all of us all the time. And you just have to be willing to operate like that. And of course we, <laughs> of course, part of operating like that is attempting to correct that to the greatest extent possible sort of, but then you get all these weird rationalists on the internet who I also think are like really strange because they get, they get so convinced that they can like logic their way to correctness that, you know, they, they end up in totally absurd places and believing really weird stuff and are totally blind to evidence. that's like right in front of their face and, and all these things. So that's not a solution either. It's just hard. It's hard. So on the one hand, I do agree with what you say uh, about this religious tendency. It's, there's like some replacement religions that have grown up in recent years to replace the fact that these people aren't going to church. Um, I don't go to church either. So, you know, um, but I don't, I'm sympathetic to it, I guess is what I'm saying, even though it may end up being intensely destructive I, I mean, I, I understand how and why it happens and I can't blame individual people for it because it's just who we are. That's what we do is we believe stuff, you know? Yeah, no, it's well said. I mean, that's, I just think you, you just see that. It's so obvious um, in my opinion. So the final, I don't want to monopolize your entire day. You've been so much of <laughs> your time, but yeah. I have one more thing I wanted to ask you about. And we've already kind of discussed it, I guess, which was you, the, your next plus was Bidenomics. We kind of already discussed this, but. <laughs> I think that there's a, I'm really, so I'm a very political person. I'm really tuned into the, to political things. I listen to a lot of political yeah. podcasts and shows and whatever. Yeah. And I'm really surprised how disconnected the polling is from what people in positions of power think the reality is. And all I have to be, all I have to do to see that they're lying is go to the supermarket um, or pay a bill. Yeah. Uh, well, and so, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish that. I've been talking. No, no. I, well, I was just, I feel like the economy is so severely broken that by nature, every facet of the economy is in itself broken. And that touches games too, Bidenomics. Yeah. Because you're talking about fluid and free money, obviously low interest rate money. That's part of it. But also things like the UBI sort of thing that spiked prices and the Janet Yellen saying that kind of the price hikes are permanent. I mean, and, and people have to know that, right? Like they don't, people think, oh, the prices are going to go back down. It's like, no, they're not. Yeah, well, that's, it. yeah. I mean, there's intentionally confusing rhetoric, right? Like right. they know that if they say inflation is going down, 
that a lot of people will think, therefore, prices will go down. But that's not what that means. Right. They mean the velocity of inflation is going down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is like the, the prices don't go down. In fact, in fact, actually, the number one mandate of the Federal Reserve is to make sure prices never start going negative because – it's certainly the belief, and it seems to have happened a number of times in history, that you end up with a giant economic black hole and like crash anytime that happens. Because the reason is, if prices are going down and you could buy more next month than you can buy this month, then you're going to save your money and nobody spends anything. And just everything just kind of collapses, right? Yeah, um, that's interesting. Now, is that true? I mean, things are different in the modern day. And so... Maybe that's not so true. Maybe they shouldn't be so afraid of that. But, um, I, you know, yeah, so this is – so I would say that I've been a little too online since 2020, certainly, and maybe a little bit before that, and spent a lot of time thinking about, for example, these political issues and trying to figure out what I actually think is true, establish my own viewpoint, right? Um, what, p part of the funny thing about me tweeting Bidenomics is like, there isn't a Bidenomics, right? It's like, what's happening is, it's an election year. They know economy is a big issue in every election. And so let's create a fiction around our candidate being good at the economy. That's all that is. There's no like real coherent philosophy that could be ascribed to this. Pre I mean, he's not a real president. All right. Like everybody knows that. Um, Certainly. And yeah. that's that's one of the lies, right? One of the lies is that this dude is making decisions that um <laughs> that are meaningful as opposed to just like getting up once in a while. I mean, do you remember when Obama was president, how many speeches that dude did and yeah. how coherent and intelligent he was? Even if he, he was a heat seeking missile policy. to the camera, dude. He you know <laughs> like there's compared to that, we there's no there's no president. There's like no anything. And we all know this, except for the people who are like really, really checked out of reality. And, you know, so you could sort of explain it by like, okay, well, the, I think the alternative would be worse or whatever. And so we're putting up with this temporary thing for four years. Oh, maybe eight years now because he's the candidate. Um, but like – the lies are, they're corrosive because for us to have um, coherence as a country, right? Um, for us to have like, again, I could use anachronistic words like strength. It's probably, um, it's probably very uh, tilting to a lot of people now to say the U.S. should be a strong country or something. But like, there's two alternatives. Like you're either you're either maintaining a reasonable degree of like, and I mean structural strength. I don't mean going around the world beating people up. I'm not a fan of that at all, right? But like, do you have a good economy? Are people doing well? Are you able to produce the things that you need or do you have to buy them all from, you know, China or something, right? And, um, you know, either you're getting stronger in that dimension or maintaining your strength or you're getting weaker. And it's very obvious that we're getting weaker, right? And, but there's all these lies that we're not. And everybody kind of knows the lie. Even if you don't know if any specific thing is a lie, we kind of know we're awash in all these lies. Mm -hmm. And the increased amount of talking due to people being on the internet all the time, I think increases awareness of the lies. Like again, in the old, like the 1950s or whatever, I think you could just listen to the radio and drink the official narrative and it was fine. But like, I think it's, Partially, the official narrative is so much less credible now, but also you can see a little bit better that it's wrong, that I think this is deeply destructive because it's hard to have morale. Like, you know, how do you have morale in a fighting unit if you hate everybody else in the unit and you're all lying to each other all the time? Mm -hmm. And if somebody says, hey, go, go patrol over there, you think maybe they're trying to kill you, Right. Um, that's not going to be a very effective fighting force. <laughs> and so like, you got to be in it together, right? And we're not in it together right now. And I don't think that's the people's fault exactly because we're being 
kind of tortured intellectually or mentally, I would say intellectual is too, too highbrow a word for what's actually happening. Um, but there, it just, if we would just stop the lying a little bit, like I don't even care which side wins, right? Let's just like stop lying for a while and the country will get a lot better. But mm, like really, both sides are really like, here's the thing. The, obviously, you know, Democrats have most of the power right now, not only at the government level, but institutionally. Like they have all the institutional power. All, all the press almost. Even Fox News is kind of left wing now, which is weird. Um, I mean, they, you know, they do talking points that are trying to be right wing. But if you look at like what policies they support actually and stuff, they're kind of left wing. And like, okay, that's, you know, that's fine. Um, I'm not a fan of Republicans either, though. I can't find a home there because like they don't have, so the Democrats uh, vision of the future is that we become more communist or whatever. Right. And the Republicans don't have a vision of the future. Their vision is just, well, let's not do the Democrat thing. And it's like, okay, but like what, if I wake up in the morning, what should I go do? And they don't have a picture that's constructive either. So both of these parties are on a destructive line, right? And um, I don't know which one is more destructive faster, actually. Um, I suspect I would at least like a different president than the one that we have now, though, because it's one of the foundational lies. It's like any... <laughs> You watch him on TV trying to get through one sentence and you know this dude isn't in charge of anything. And like, let's just, let's just call that like it is. And, you know, elect a different, if you're a Democrat, elect a different Democratic president. It'll be fine. Yeah, it'll be basically the same thing because it's just about the, the party platform anyway, generally speaking. Yeah, I think the lies <sighs> yeah. are so obvious and so brazen. Going all the way back to Russia collusion, the origins no, of so COVID. Many, if like, you list them, some people do these memes on the internet where they like yeah. list all of them. And it's such a long list. You couldn't even read it in this podcast. Right. Um, and we just have to stop it. And um, cause there are positive things that we could have as a unifying agenda, right? Like, look, let's have a good economy. Let's the problem is not really that people disagree about what, makes an economy strong. There is some disagreement. There's not that much disagreement, right? What it really is, is there's people who want to steal money, who have a vested interest in creating arguments that are easily debunked, but arguments about that this thing is a good economic idea or that mm. thing is a bad economic idea because it allows them to take their rake, right? And so there's this very loud, there's a number of very loud megaphones through which these kind of lies are propagated. And nobody's serious believe some of these things, right? I mean, nobody serious believes you should pay students for taking out student loans that were disadvantageous because that all that does is raises the cost of college by even more, right? Right. Um, right. So, and everybody knows that. No, Nobody serious will deny that claim. It's very easy to observe, right? And, um, and so, so like, yes, you're paying off the student loan, but you're making it even worse for the next students. Like, so even if you thought it was in principle a good thing to do, it's not a good thing to do. And it's also like, how much more can you blatantly aim at your voters in quotes? Well, what about, yeah, what about the, the blue collar dude's mortgage, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. But the thing is, it's just so, um, it's just too much. It's, it's too much for too long. And this is the thing. I think you started this part of the conversation by saying like, you directly called out the lying and you, you said like something like, how can they get away with it? And I think the answer is they can get away with it until they can't and they'll keep doing it until it falls apart. Right. And the only way, the only way that that gets countered is mostly from within these institutions. And I think most of the institutions don't have the people in them anymore who are willing to do that unpleasant work of, uh, you know, countering the entropy. There's this entropy where you want to slide downhill into just like, you know, mild to intermediate levels of corruption. And you have to have people who are constantly every day pushing back against that. And I'm not sure we have that anymore because again, that requires belief, right? You have to believe that all the crap you're taking every day for pushing back against these various kinds of corruption is worth it. And if you don't believe, if you're not spiritual, at least, right, or you don't believe in 
that certain kinds of nas- national cohesion are important or you don't believe that they're achievable and you're instead just minding your own little job, um, yeah, you're not going to push back against that. I shouldn't, you know, I don't know that many people in government. I do know a few. Um, it's not really something I have a lot of experience in. So this is mostly a hallucination that I have about how things are. But as, as I just said, almost everything we believe is a hallucination anyway. So it's fine. It's, to- <laughs> it's totally true. I keep I said that recently mm-hmm. on a show that someone was like, what conspiracy theories do you believe? And I'm like, pretty much all of them at this point. I mean, like with, with the exception of some of the, you know, I, I used the moon landing as one where I'm like, well, you can see that, that the, we went to the moon. I, I, always I think that, I think we landed on the moon. But again, yeah, no, I, totally. I believe I believe that we landed on the moon in the same way I believe there's a war in Ukraine. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, I didn't go to the moon. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but you could see you could see evidence of it. Right. Yeah. It's, like it's so it's so fascinating to get into this conversation with you, because one thing you said, I totally agree with. I agree with a lot of what you said, but is that neither side is for me either really i'm a hard no personally from my own perspective i'm a hard no on the democrats just because yeah. they're leader and there's just a lot of insanity I, I in that believe party, me i understand but, that um, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to vote this year probably um because i think even a protest vote like that 30 minutes that i would spend doing that um, I probably should be programming instead. Yeah, <laughs> I think a video I'm, game, right? I think I'll vote RFK probably. To be perfectly okay. honest with you, I, I I want to. I'm not an accelerationist, not yet, but yeah, like there needs to be some level of shat. Like, what I really think, I've said this before. This has nothing to do with video games, but yeah. is everyone, no one getting to 270 in the House, right? And then it, well, and then it gets thrown to the House, and you have this thing, and at least the Democrats and Republicans are scared into normal action again. By being like weird, you're not permanent necessarily. We- yeah, I don't know if that matters though. Like, I think it's just too far gone. Like, you know, the common stat you'll see is that approval rating for Congress members is already tremendous. It's like twenty three percent or whatever. Right. It's horrible, and yet they have really long careers. Why? Why do the same people get elected all the time if nobody approves of them? And the answer is because the machines are so strong, right? Totally. I, there, there's a piece, dude, I, it's so funny you say this. I, I was reading this when I was, um, was waiting for you. It's on Politico and it was, where is it? Oh, I lost it. There was a, there's a guy like an older congressman who they just wrote a piece about saying that it, basically we've spoken to 14 people on, you know, anonymously. So, that, you know, to protect their, protect who they are. And they're basically like, oh, this congressman, that's the head of the, uh, the agriculture committee is totally insane. Has no idea what's going on. And he's running for re-election and for his twenty for his twelfth term. Yeah. And people are like, he literally goes to conferences and reads entirely off of a paper. Yeah. You can't get meetings with him. You meet with his staff and all of that. So this is it, this is just broke today as we're recording. And it's like there's so much lying, there's so much obfuscation. I agree that the system is broken. I think breaking it even more might actually solve the problem on the back end. And I'm totally with you. I'm not interested in either side. And I'm I'm so you know what Jonathan as we wrap this up I just first of all I want to thank you for being here but I also I really appreciate your candor because a lot of people in positions of power and that have reputations don't say anything meaningful regardless of what you think of there's that. a story sure they say the same they say yeah. the safe thing you know it's very easy to say the safe thing yeah uh, um so I just wanted to thank you for that I, th- I think it's awesome that you were you're you're able to do that I feel like I'm in a not nearly in as prestigious situation as you are but I'm similarly disconnected where I'm like I don't really care what people yeah. think about like my politics or what I have to say it's like I'm just going to speak honestly and openly and, and hopefully fairly and people will see it for what it is literally every time I say stuff like this I get a bunch of crap for it right and I think the thing is and, and, you know, this has always been true. Even before the internet, you would always have people just saying the talking points and not wanting to generate controversy by going off script or whatever. But um, we kind of have to deal with it. Like, like it definitely became worse with the internet, again, because there's just so much more talking. And if I'm going to have a long-term vision, again... Um, we have to somehow just figure out how to deal with this as humanity. Like, how do you deal with the fact that a bunch of people can just say a bunch of crap about you anytime they want and you can see it and everybody else can see it. And like, I think the only sane response is to just ignore that stuff or filter it out or something. Um, 
but like we have to culturally iterate till we get there. And maybe if not enough people speak, honestly, we instead develop a culture of just being afraid to talk. Right. And so I don't think we should be afraid to talk. I would not feel like I, I would not have full self-respect if I felt like I was able, if I felt like I was afraid to talk, it's just part of my personality. Right. And so, um, I think it would be very advantageous to all of us if we can find a way to just steer the culture to a place where people are not afraid to talk. And I think that is a danger, right? Like the, the USA I grew up in the, the kind of, uh, reticence to be honest that you're talking about was mostly reserved for, you know, politicians or CEOs of big companies or whatever. Right. Um, but as the internet exploded, I think it's now a thing that's felt by everybody. Everybody feels this pressure that if they say the wrong thing, it could be really bad. And that's true, but I think it's also just destructive to the soul to live in that way. It's like you live behind the iron curtain again, all of a sudden. Right. Um, and so we have to just not do that. I, I would like to not do that. I would like mm -hmm. to live in a USA where people are um, as free to express themselves as they were when I grew up. And, you know, some people might say some stuff that you think is repugnant, but that's part of the constant struggle that we have to refine our society and make it better. And, um, it's just life. And I prefer letting us live life rather than like, eh, I'm scared, you know, the whole time. So that's all. So I, I think that's part of why I, I, you know, tweet Bidenomics exclamation point or whatever <laughs> is because I just, I, I, I just don't want to see us keep going the direction that that stuff's been going. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to, first of all, I completely agree. I think more talking is better. I think people dis that disagree with me talking is actually good for me um, because it strengthens my arguments, I think, by weakening their own. And so I want m more talking, much more. And well, I talking is how you figure out what you actually think, right? Right, right. Yeah. Sorry. Go yeah. Ahead. No, it, it's, it's well said. I mean, I've <laughs> often said that, um, not to get too political, but this has come up in the past in different contexts, is that when I went to college, uh, which I went to, I started going to college in 2000. Two, um, I was pro-life. And by the time I left college, I was pro-choice, specifically by just listening to people's arguments for really the first time ever and being like, oh, yeah, OK, this resonates with me. Like, you have to just be malleable. I was also deeply neoconservative at that, at, at that era, and I'm like completely anti-war now. You have to I often I found the errors in my own ways, from my perspective, by listening to people. So I, I hope we can talk again, Jonathan. I, I appreciate you taking the time. You're, it was an awesome podcast and you're very welcome here anytime you want to be yeah thanks man thanks for having me on yeah you're very welcome and uh i appreciate all of you out there you know the drill patreon.com slash last day media for more we'll see you next time until then goodbye sacred symbols a playstation podcast is a product and trademark of last stand media and collins last stand llc and is proudly recorded in the usa the show is conceived by is written by and is directed by me colin moriarty my co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.